and we can combine that and then we can have very, very strong predictions. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And uh, well, we always had this vision, uh, at least those people who have been very in AI uh, and before uh, to be able to automate cognitive thinking and uh, to make it more real to make it more human and one important aspect there is it has to be able to have experience to store knowledge it has to have this memory aspect into this aspect of context and I have worked for SAP which uh, is the biggest business software company in the world and uh, the old traditional systems there, they are transactional systems that do accounting, and there's no context. Even if most of the context is actually you take it, you copy it on a piece of paper, you take an order number, and then you go into the next transaction. Very different from what uh, most of you, at least the young ones here, grew up uh, like on our, on our touch screens and, and smartphones, where we have a lot of context, notably uh, the location. And um, there are a couple of other companies in this space, and maybe you know one or the other. Um, you might know VetaWeb, um, who offers you a unique URI, a unique identifier for semantics, for a semantic term. So they are able to find out that you find Steve Jobs, for instance, on the web, and he's the CEO, or has been the CEO of Apple, and then you find Steve Jobs, uh, the head of the soccer, the local soccer association, the president in Cupertino. And you find out that it is the same person. And that's a pretty tricky task. And that's what MetaWeb did uh, manually, albeit there was a lot of manual effort involved. Uh, but that's what they did. And then they were bought by Google. And I guess you have heard of Jeff Hawkins' company, Numenta. He's making a lot of uh, commercials out there now. And he has been always about uh, brain-like computing. And then you have other companies, AI1. It's just to show you, uh, I don't want to claim we are the first ones in this space. And the idea of associations, of being able um, to uh, search and to understand data in uh, a brain-like way, uh, goes back uh, to a famous guy, uh, Van Ever Bosch, a big am American engineer um, who uh, initiated and managed the Manhattan Project, who so started NSF, and I'm sure that's important here at the university, and he was also the founder of Raytheon, and he invented a mechanical uh, hyperlink. So in those days, they had microfishes, and he developed a machine that was able to do hyperlinks uh, in microfishes. And so he was thinking about a machine that computes like, or works like the brain by association, by finding things that are similar instead of just indexing them, and it has to be mechanized, because he was thinking about mechanics in those days. And now you might smile, but wait a moment, there is a big project at uh, Berkeley where they work on mechanical computers, where they have switches that work mechanical, and they're already pretty fast. Um, and what's the advantage? They generate much less entropy. They generate, they have no leakage, right? A microchip has quite considerable leakage, and that by itself physically limits the number of cores you can ever have. And that would not have mechanically. So then we go on, and then we have Doug Engelbert, who did the hypertext as we know it, and then the World Wide Web, and Tim Berners Lee, who had the vision of the semantic web, uh, which we have not yet realized. And there we go back. All we need, actually, is 
we need connections and counts. This is how the brain works, how evolution has made it. And there are three ways to compute, which the first way is the way we use nowadays is this Pontefa Neumann architecture. We have a compute power in the CPU, and we have a storage unit, and it is separate. And the CPU has is tacked in about uh, one nanosecond. It's a synchronous process. Um, and we have to shift the data between the DRAM and the CPU, and that leads to a couple of problems. And so far, we have about three caches in between. And uh, if you do think about CC NUMA virtualization of I.O., we will have a fourth one. Um, we generate a lot of entropy that way, uh, actually the most of, of all ways to compute. And when I first uh, saw a computer, which was in 1976, I was very surprised why people would come up with a universal clock speed. Because uh, I don't know any process in chemistry, physics, or in biology that has a synchronized clock speed. The second way to compute was also invented by von Neumann and Stanislav Ulam, who was the co-inventor of the hydrogen bomb together with Teller, and it is cellular automator. And you might know it or not. And the third way is associative memories. And that's what uh, we'll talk about more in detail. Um, and associative memories are synchronous. And the compute unit and the storage unit is one, like in the synapse. And uh, I'm a physicist, and I can go on and give you a separate talk about all of that. But I have only one slide. So bear with me one slide, and then I come back uh, to the computer science aspect. And then we do mainly that. And then in the end, we could look a little bit at statistics and what we can do. The mathematical model for associative memories uh, was invented by a physicist called Hopfield. And he did that because he wanted to understand a uh, phase transition, a transition, an order, disorder transition, the transition that we find, for instance, in ferromagnets. Right? And if you look at ferromagnets and you look at uh, the thermodynamics, you see that there are two terms. One, this is the entropy term, and the tight temperature, as we all remember from school. Entropy is the dominant term. And those uh, dipoles, those spins, they orient themselves uh, basically randomly. And at lower temperature, it's clear that the entropy doesn't play a role anymore. It is the interaction, the localized interaction between those spins that wins, and they start to orient themselves. And so far, so good. That is a simple thermodynamic consideration. But the surprising thing, and it took a long time to understand that, and um, in some very deep sense, we have not yet fully got that. That goes into chaos theory. The surprising thing is that the transition happens at a very well-defined temperature, which is the Curie temperature. And it happens very suddenly. And basically, what happens is, um, the phase transitions, there are uh, fixed points. There's a Lyapunov function that describes the whole thing. And um, we arrive at an equilibrium, and those uh, spins orient themselves. And the asso associative memories are a way to simulate that. They are isomorphic, so there's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship um, uh, between associative memories and uh, the Hopfield network. And so associative memories, they look something like that. Every neuron or every node is connected to everyone. You might know neural networks, and then you remember they have an input and an output node, and they have a hidden layer. That's not happening in associative memories. Every node is connected with everyone. There is no input and output layer. And as you can see, here's an example of six uh, cells. And then you have, for instance, here um, eight. Uh, those things grow combinatorically. So you have a challenge uh, to handle that um, and to make it uh, performing. But what happens is you give this associative memory a vector, and the vector may be salary, your FICO score, your gender, and it may be missing some elements in this vector. And, but we want to identify a person. And then you give it to the associative memory, and it will move to the closest fixed point, to the, the, the fixed point that is the closest to this vector. And that's how you can do association. So you can recall what you have learned. And that's actually called auto-association. 
And such an associative memory can have a lot, a lot of fixed points. And it has basically something like a Lyapunov function. This is the Ising model, but the Lyapunov function can be derived from that. And the Lyapunov function guarantees that no matter where we are, we will reach an equilibrium, like what we saw with those disks. And the equilibrium is very well defined. It's actually defined by the weight. And in the case of an Hopfield network, it is mathematically defined. So there's no training like uh, in other cases. Uh, the weights can be pre-calculated. Um, what Saffron does is we don't use a Hopfield network. Uh, the reason is simple. The Hopfield network works only, it can only store, uh, it, you can only load it to about 15% of its capacity. And then it makes uh, mistakes because then those, those fixed points come very close and it jumps from one to another one. Uh, what we have done is uh, we use matrices. And I'll explain to you uh, in the next slides how that works. So the input can be anything. It can be tweets. It can be stock data. It can be uh, any kind of social data. It can be transactional data. This is where the sweet spot is, where, where, where we, we see something very new in big data, which we haven't seen before. We can combine transactional data, which companies have had for a long time in their business warehouse. We can combine them with the social data, the data from the web, which is the content, which is the unstructured data. And then uh, we generate a semantic graph, generate a complete semantic graph. And on the edges, we have the counts. So what we build is connections and counts. And then we can recall them. And we can say who is related to whom, what have we seen, um, who has been in this location the most, and uh, we can find pattern, we can do pattern recognition, and we can look in the, in the future and we can see what's going to happen. So we have a sense-making part, a search part, and then we have a, a part that is forward-looking, decision-making, um, which is a, a prediction part. So how does that work? So let me, let's take this example. How would we construct an associative memory? We have a sentence here, and uh, we do a natural language processing. We have to extract uh, the nouns from the sentence, uh, the verbs, and the adjectives. We extract triples, predicate, subject, and object or value. Um, and then we throw out all those things that are in black, like for and so on. And uh, we construct a memory. We build a memory for each of those entities. So the first entity is John Smith. And then we build an entity uh, for United Airlines and uh, for the Prime Minister. And then those, those memories, they have attributes. And those attributes are uh, the verbs and uh, adjectives and stuff that is not entities. And we build this connection and we store them. And then it, that allows us, if we now have stored all those entities, then to say who met the prime minister in the London on a rainy day. And there we go. And we would find John Smith and maybe the other people. But then we also may know on which date. And then the result may be not uniquely, depending on what it is. But you see how we can record because we have stored all those connections. And if you think about it, if you think about it in a relational language, that is um, materialized view. We store every relationship to everything. So, yeah, go ahead. And yeah, because it is as much attached to John Smith than to the date. Right? It is uh, at this level. At this level, um, we don't. We know that it was an adjective, but since we analyze at the sentence level, it is attached to everything else. It's also attached to the United Airlines. Yeah, that's a smart question. Hmm? Well, that is just a mistake of uh, of the drawing. Sorry. No, 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 there's nothing subtle. That should be too. That's actually a good point. Never ever anybody saw that before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
everything is connected to everything. And think here about if you think about Google, or maybe you have done a MapReduce job, and then one of the first things you do in class, right, is um, you do an inverted index. You do a word count on your documents. And that is at the document level. But here we talk about the sentence level, and we relate sentences in documents to each other. And there are not many companies out there who can do that. There are some others, the Vistimo company that IBM bought, where you can look at sub-documents and make relationships. But that is a, a very important point I make uh, on this year. Rain is not, it should be. <laughs> well, very well observed. And now we build a matrix. So this is, uh, so the memory is, they are, uh, it's just a term. Right, and it's a, a little bit name dropping. It's not like a memory in the brain, but we think of it that way. It has similar properties. It can recall, it has associations, and it never forgets. Actually, in that sense, it's better than our memory. But it is materialized, it is instantiated as a matrix. Actually, as a couple of matrices, but in this simple case, as a matrix. And here we go, and we have uh, place, person, organization, and then we have those filler verbs. And it is, uh, in a, it is a symmetric matrix, and it has all 1, 1, 1, because we have observed it 1, 1, 1, and we have observed Rainey and Jay once, and we have observed Rainey and London once, and the Prime Minister once. We do not understand uh, more subtleties uh, that Rainey is. We are know that it is an adjective, but we don't know that it was to the day. But I mean, a human being would make sense out of it when you recall it. There wouldn't be a Rainey Prime Minister, right? Okay, so uh, the nice thing is um, we look at the snippet scope that's much more uh, precise uh, than the document level. And the, another company you might know, Radiant 6, voice of the customer, they only look at the document level. Most people who analyze uh, documents, or most companies do this at the document level. We have semantic triple. And that is very important. That's a very deep point. Uh, I can't stress enough, and we'll come back later at the statistics to it. Um, you can do pairwise association and pairwise correlation. But then you would say maybe, uh, for instance, you say Cha and Paul. And that can be very broad. You can get a lot of stuff. We met in Shanghai. Uh, we met at, in Illinois, in Utah, wherever. But if you say Paul and Cha at Silicon Valley campus of CMU, you narrow it down. Pairwise associations are very, very noisy. That's why you want to have triple. So the context comes from the triple. You can think of it like a, like a conditional probability. Then we have frequencies. These are here the counts. This is frequencies. So this is the, this, the triples built the semantic graph. We built the graph. The counts uh, give us relevance because we built huge graphs, right? You can't even look at them anymore. We analyze, we analyze uh, big data. And then the frequencies tell us, is it important or not? Is this connection important? Have we seen it only once, or have we seen it a million times or a thousand times? Also, the frequencies allow us to make the connection to calculate correlations, to calculate dependence and independence, and those things. And then what, what, what is very important, we materialize the view. So um, uh, you know there is a trade-off. There's a, this is an important tra thing to think about. Uh, if you think about relational, um, the trade-off is, is even much more on that side. There's a trade-off between what do you do at query time and what do you do at ingest when you take the data in. And relational, now you, here this is all out of the box, right? We didn't put in anything. At relational, you have to put in a schema. You have to sit down and think about your tables, normalization, and all of this. And then the question is, do you materialize your view, um, which takes more time at, uh, in chess, but it's much faster at query. And so we have a materialized view, and the evolution has done it that way too. Our brain is a materialized view. We store all the li latest details. There are no joints, right? It's, there is not something like a join that happens. Think, relational is a good example of that. Uh, you don't make joints, right? And this is, I, when I was teaching, um, I always said um, the difference between objects and the world and relational is like you drive your car in the garage, this is how the real world is, this is how objects work. Relational is you take the wheels off, you put them in the shelf for the wheels, and then you put the seats off, put them in the shelf, 
and so on. And then when you recall it, you have to build it to put it together for a car. Of course, there are trade-offs. There are advantages of putting the wheel separately. But we have material as you. Okay, now let's come back to this example. Now we have done John Smith. Now we do the same story for the place London. And we connect London to all what we have seen in this sentence, the organization United Airlines and the person prime minister. And that is uh, our first sentence analyzed and stored in the memory. Now we come to the next sentence. And we say, John Smith, he also met with the House of Commons while in London. And then we have to add the House of Commons, right? Because we didn't have that yet. London we have already. So we have London. And we say meet. It gets the two. Um, and then we have to have a memory for the House of Commons, as you can see. Um, Prime Minister is untouched. Um, in London, we add also a two to meet. And then here we have the House of Commons. And you see what's going to happen is, um, you see here there are also zeros where there's no value. We get matrices. We form huge matrices, and they're very sparse. No, no predefined ontologies, and that is the advantage. That's the difference, for instance, to Watson. Watson is a similar approach, and uh, we can talk about it maybe later. But Watson has two differences. It uh, needs predefined ontologies, and you talk to IBM, that's what they do now. You get a nice job, or whatever you do, they love you if you can define those ontologies. Um, the second thing is they cannot increment the link chest like what you have seen here. I see a new sentence. I build on the fly the new attributes and the new memories. I can do that incrementally. Watson cannot do that incrementally. And then there is a much bigger difference in the sense Watson is fact-based, right? You have facts up front, and then uh, you build statistics on top of those facts, whereas this approach it is instance-based. And it is evidence-based. It's not fact-based, right? We, we collect evidence and not facts that we combine with each other. No weights. Yeah, this is the difference. This is the difference to uh, what you may, may think of uh, neural nets. Uh, you have to put weights, and the weights, um, they are, you, have to, you have to parameterize them. So you, you, have only, you have only counts, right? So what we do is we, we take an input vector and we map it into a von Neumann uh, space, which is just another word for bit vector. We map it into zeros and ones, and we'll see on the next slide, that is where we can do hybrid, where we can do text and unstructured. Um, it all gets digitized. Yeah. Yeah. It knows it from the NLP part. But you, you do, can do that out of the box. It may be, yes. And there may be mistakes, for instance. For instance, one, one pretty tricky part is to find the difference between us and US. US with no points, uh, a, a naive NLP would not find the difference. And, and don't think now, I mean, now I hold you back. There is no machine that is as good in NLP as human beings, right? That's what we have. That is our specific by evolution and who knows by what. That is very tough for a machine to go there. But uh, I just give you the difference. Uh, think about Google. You type in in Google. Google does not know the difference between a noun and a verb if they are the same. No. So here we know we know uh, we know organi we know certain things like things. Uh, so things, people, organization, location, and things is like product. We can do sentiment, and we can do a lot of stuff out of the box. That's it's in the NLP part. It's uh, it's before you load it into the memory, right? No, no, I, I, I did analyze. For instance, you might know this uh, the Cornell movie data set. Where, we, where you have movie critics. And they analyzed it with sentiment. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if I have it here to show you. But uh, what happens is then there is a pleasant will. And it took me, I demoed it. And then for a couple of minutes, it took me, oh, wait a moment. That's not really a, a city. 
it's the name of the movie. Later, I realized that it's also a city. So, well, that would even cheat the human being, right? Yeah, NLP is very tricky. Uh, there are people out there who do, who put all this compute power of associative memories, of a neuronal approach, into uh, the NLP part. And the lady who does that is actually uh, Monica Anderson, and she's able to read uh, Jane Austen, a Jane Austen novel. And the machine does not know anything. It doesn't even know words. It just gets letters. But our approach is, I don't waste my compute power for the NLP part. I take it as much as it can. I'm not against ontologies. If there are ontologies, we can use them too. But uh, the strength is it's out of the box without ontology. Well, you have to have an, an annotation. That is what we did here. The NLP part, it does you do the annotation and markup. So when you have image, and we do image too, because we, are, we do security, we come from, from the National Security and Department of Defense, then you have somebody who does the markup. So they are do face recognition. That actually in itself is associative memory. So the, the face recognition software you can buy in the store runs on an associative memory. Because it's non-trivial to find the eye, the nose, and that you can move. That is also done by associative memories. So who of you actually has heard of associative memories before this talk? Very cool, yeah. It's also a generational problem. That's not true here. But uh, the younger guys, uh, they learn it at school, and they know Hopfield, and they know that you cannot do X or uh, in, the, in the simple uh, neural network. You need a hidden layer, and so on. OK, yeah, most of associative memories nowadays are used in robots. About, I just give you, it's Pareto. Over 80% of the robots that we have, uh, they use an associative memory. But uh, nobody uses this yet, or we are coming to use it for big data. So let me go on. The next step is, I show you an example, how do we structure data. So imagine you have a table, and you have orders, and suppliers, and the company. And then so we take the first line, and we build the company, the person. And we, again, we build this matrix. I left out the other one. It's a matrix. And then we come to the second line. And there we have to add what we didn't see before, like company HP, like contact Mary. And, um, and then the order date we had, for instance, already. So we added two. And then comes the third line. And we always add uh, what we don't have. And you see this thing grows. And what you see very nicely here is how sparse it becomes. You do not want to, the trick now is, uh, why do we come only to market now and not 10 years ago? And it took us about 10 years to do that. It's how do you store those past matrices efficiently and be able to access them in real time? OK, before we come to one aspect of how we do that, uh, how do you have seen now those matrices. And those matrices, they are connected, right? And this is just a picture how they build a graph. How they are connected, because we have this matrix for John, and then we have a row for London, right? And then we have another matrix for London, and there we have a row for John. This is, so to speak, how they are connected. So our know-how is, and our IP is, that we have taken a 3D graph and mapped it into 2D in matrices. And then you can see here you have a row for London, and you say, um, then you have columns for carriers, for the airlines, and then you can see John Smith flew 17 times to American Airlines and twice with United Airlines, and maybe once he lost, he didn't catch his flight, and uh, we flew, he flew with British Airlines. And so this is about localization now. Now we talk about, um, um, I actually have a slide on, the, on this one. Uh, you know, there is SQL, and we are moving away from SQL. And why is that? Because it doesn't really scale. We don't know how to distribute it. Because logically, it is one. It's like a funnel, and then it has to be serialized. That's why it has those nice properties like ACID. And then on the other extreme of NoSQL, we have, um, we have key value stores, um, like, uh, and we have MapReduce, and like Amazon, and Voldemort, and all those things out there. And the Silicon Valley is full of them. And they are keep going to be invented. But they have a disadvantage. They're very simple. They're kind of only for things that are embarrassingly parallel. And that applies especially for MapReduce. So what you want to find is the, the important thing uh, 
the Mount Everest in computer science for NoSQL is to find the right localization. And so, as you can see, one localization here are those matrices, and then other localization is the row, and that's what we actually do. Uh, we localize along the row. And then this row is stored, if possible, on one spindle. And so you can see, you can go very fast, and you can say how often did John fly to London with American Airlines, all right? Because you go here, and then you run there, and you can do that in real time, even if you have billions of matrices. So now I do something for you computer scientists. I go a little bit more in the implementation. Um, yeah, I think we are pretty good in time. So, yeah, um, you want to have co-locality, you want to have distribution, you want to also compress it because you don't want to store the zeros. Most of those matrices have, are filled with zeros. Most of those count for zero. It would be mad to do that. So then we do like everybody does. We have a high bit and a low bit, and the high bit is the category value, and this is our term for the attribute and the attribute value, or you think of it an attribute, and the attribute has an alphabet. Basically, it is a random variable, and it is the instances. And then there comes other stuff, and then the low bit are the values. So here, we have to partition now the matrix, and that's what happens. Some of those matrices are shorter and longer, depending on the zeros, and you have to do hypersparse encoding, and I come to that. I'll show you that on a, on a bigger example. So then you go on and you take the category and the value and you hash it. You come to one ID and um, one very important aspect of associative memories is that they are content addressable. That is something very huge if you have to distribute them. So the content tells me where they are located. Okay? That's what's happening here. And then you distribute them uh, over a server cluster. So the next step, goes a little bit more in detail of that. Um, if the matrix is small, um, if the matrix is uh, small, you can directly partition and put it on, a, on the spindle. If not, you have to put it on different spindles and you do hypersparse encoding in it. So now let's look, at, let's look at this example, John Smith and the place London. Uh, like I said, we uh, do the matrix ID and the row ID, we hash them, and then we have distributed modulo 10, assuming that we have, for instance, 10 servers. So we find the location directly from the content. You don't have a centralized, you don't need a centralized lookup. Like, for instance, you have in, in, in MapReduce. Yeah. I mean, they're changing that now, too, because they realize that's a bottleneck. Um, in the sense of that you run out of hash space, it's, it's predefined like you saw before. You have to define your 64 uh, bytes. You have to define it up front. What, what, what is the category value and what is um, the content? But, uh, and you have a freedom. You can configure that. But that was where the numbers that are most used. And then that's it. If you run out of that space, you have bad luck. But um, I give you an example later where we, where we predict the threat score for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And there we have uh, the attribute vector is a million. So we form a million by a million by a million, which is a trillion triples. We don't really store a trillion triples because of the sparsity. But uh, and uh, you would, I don't know any problem where you would run out of it. But of course, there's always a limitation. That's how computer science is. Okay, so I don't know. You want to to see that how we do the? No, no, that because it's deterministic. You don't have collision. It's deterministic. And I, I, I a friend of mine, uh, Scott Brandt, who is down there in UC Santa Cruz, and he does. Um, he does storage, high performance storage. He does the Large Hadron Collider and with Sandia Labs and Berkeley Lawrence Livermore and so on. And he has a very similar concept. Um, you, you have to distribute your directory at one point, but you have to do it, you have to have a deterministic hash. And that's the way to do it. And in this, and in this case, this goes very deep. 
this is how associative memories are done. So evolution came also to this conclusion. Right, and so there's also, this goes very deep. I don't know, we can, we can talk hours about it. I know there's one neuroscientist still here. The brain works the same way. We don't use all of the brain. It would be overloaded if you would use all of it. Uh, there would be collisions, funny things happening, and we don't know, understand yet very fully, but we don't even use 20% uh, or so. I don't remember the number exactly. And it's changing a little bit. But we use only a very small part. So you have to have a redundant. All right, um, I'm not sure if you are bored by that. You want to know how we do the zeros? This is patented, so I can show you that. Um, um, I don't know. You want to go through the example? What's your opinion? Or, or we go more to a use case? Okay. So let's say there are two, there are two uh, control bits. Um, one is it's, it tells you the end of the encoding, and another one tells you the, the zero content tells you the end, and the one tells you continue. And the other control bit tells you zero lengths comes. We, we don't think all what comes now means zero zeros, and we don't store them, we don't encode them, we have only one bit. And then you have to have to indicate where the counter is, right? If it's all stored in one, um, we have to store an ID and the counter. So let's assume we have a zero here, and then we say um, zero. So this is basically where we start. And now um, the ID is. Um, 0, 1, 1, we go from this side, from the high end, it is 22. And then we put in a 1, and that indicates now comes the counter, and then the counter is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, so the ID is 22, and the count is 6. So that's how we encode uh, ID 22 and count 6, and the ID, like I said, came from hashing the category and the value. And then comes the next one, and the next one is 23, okay. And then we say uh, we continue, um, and then we continue, and we continue till we come up to a zero, and then we have to go back that way, and then we calculate the next ID, which is uh, from 22, we calculate the next ID, which is uh, 23 plus this number, so we come, this is a nice example, it's one million or so. You see, this is super sparse. We jump from ID 22 to ID one million, right? And I don't think you can encode that much more efficient. And now we need the, uh, the count for this ID. So we have again a zero, that means something new comes. We have the one for the count, and in this case, it's a simple count, it's five. So we have patented that about 10 years ago. Um, and that is kind of how it is stored. Oops, that was a little bit mixed up. But anyway, what I just want to say is um, tables have a big advantage over the graphs. We have no table joints. We don't do semantics. We can do about 20 million triples a minute. Uh, that's pretty fast. We're actually the fastest triple store in the world, so we claim um, very close to uh, Allegro graph from France. They store, they have a world record in storing more triples. They have done this thing, tuned it with, with Intel. We have a very linear uh, linearity for ingestion. That's very important that you, that you stay linear, um, that you don't go up. Um, and one important thing is the semantic expansion is about three. That's very good. Because in the early days, associative memory is at a factor of 10. So you will, whatever you have originally, you would have 10 times as much data later. And that wasn't very good. So this is another very important thing. And then we can query in, in sub-seconds. Um, that probably doesn't mean too much to you, but you might know um, big query from Google, right? And they can analyze Wikipedia. We can do that too. And then they ask a question. I don't remember exactly what it was, but they ask, um, how many games have been won by this and that team in the National Football League? And I think it took them 10 seconds. That takes for us sub seconds. But otherwise, BigQuery is pretty similar. It is a, a row approach, and the rows are distributed via a graph. So much to that. And then there is a very nice book. If you like that, I love it. I read it always on the plane, find new stuff. It is, came out by the Lincoln Labs, and a lot of people associated to it. 
a lot of famous professors in this area who have worked on graphs. And um, they show that graphs are uh, isomorph to matrices. And matrices are beautiful because there we can use linear algebra. This is much easier to use. Graphs are very hard to understand, to picture, and even to program. It's very tough. So uh, we reduce, uh, we use linear algebra, which is, is something very nice. Um, it performs better matrices. They are syntactically simpler, and they can be implemented simpler. And this book just came out pretty recently. We have patented that and worked on that about 10 years ago. So that's kind of something nice. So it's nice to see that others think that way too. Now, now comes more the commercial side. Um, what do our customers do? We came from uh, Department of Defense and National Security, and now we're moving out into global risk um, and into companies that are naturally very close. And our next step is, I have one slide on that too, we're moving into personalized marketing. Because, um, and that is very deep, and we talk about it later if we have time, or we just skip it. Uh, what we can do is um, we can we can work and analyze where statistics doesn't work anymore, where your distribution isn't Gaussian, uh, where your vector that you analyze is much bigger than the number of observations. How can you do that, right? How can you have more attributes and and predict if it's less uh, than your number of observations? So, and here you see some of our companies. Um, and Office of the Naval Research, I guess, is pretty close to where you are here at the NASA. It's a government organization. And don't take my word for it. Others uh, say that. They say the future is, by the way, hybrid. It is the combination of structured and content. And here we are with autonomy, Endeka, Watson, Artesio, AI1, and other guys. And that's a slide from Gartner. Um, yeah, right. Here, uh, that's what we did in the very early days. So we reduced um, the uh, improvised explosive devices considerably in Iraq. And it's a nice example how those things work. Originally, they came and asked us, um, yeah, we give you satellite pictures. And then you analyze if you see agglomerations of people around the road. And that naturally would be where they plant the bomb. Okay. And that's what we did, but then we said, oh, we can do much better. We can move less to the boom. We can analyze the network. We can analyze where they build the bomb, where the people get trained for it, and when they transport it. And that was when the IEDs went considerably down. Um, I'm going to show you now a little demo. And I hope it all works here. And you get another voice than mine. And uh, here we go. <laughs> In the following example, we will demonstrate the power of national security style intelligence. Saffron has been able to help the US Department of Defense because it works 500,000 times faster than normal human reading. Now business can use this approach to make better decisions based on all kinds of data. In this example, we will use Reuters News as the source data. Reuters is a feed of newspaper articles from all over the world all made up of text. You can imagine that it is unstructured, fast moving and in very high volumes. But that's perfect for Saffron. Let's imagine we need to research terror risks in London for an upcoming event. We need to look for worrying patterns and possible problems. Who are the key players? How do they fit together? In a real world crisis, we may have just minutes to work it out. We start with Advantages Dashboard, which is designed to highlight people, places and things who have the highest volume of new associations with other people, places and things. In this sense-making exercise, we are interested in people and we see right away that a person, Abu Hamza, is new to our entity space. Looking below at Association Trends, we also see Abu Hamza at the top of the new and interesting list indicating that he has the most frequent occurrences in the data for this time period. Given this new and interesting section, let's find out more information by creating a query starting with Abu Hamza. We are taken automatically 
to Saffron's Entity Ranking View, which presents all the entities associated with Abu Hamza by entity category and in ranked order of association with him. Below, Saffron has identified three... Just uh, to point that out, you see the difference to Google? You type in Abu Hamza, like you do in Google, but that then you get an entity rank of people related to it, of countries related to it, to organizations related to it. The input was more than in Google. There was no ontologies involved, but you get a natural ranking of those entities as an output. I wanted just to point that point out here. Now we go on. Yep. Can we do what? Yeah, I have it. I can show you later. I, 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 we have ten minutes left, so I want to I want to talk about gates. And, and one more use case. But I can show you, I have a demo of LinkedIn, and I can search LinkedIn much smarter than LinkedIn can, right? LinkedIn, they have Voldemort, so it's a key value store. They don't find much. Um, and uh, do you have to pay? Why do you have to pay for it? Because they wouldn't be able to offer it to everybody. It wouldn't scale at all. But also, uh, it's very tough for them to make connections and to understand. And I can understand the semantics on LinkedIn. I can understand, and the example would be uh, who is what are the qualities and who is similar to a, 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 an engineer who, who works in GSI? And they can see what they have studied and they can pull them out just from their signature, from, from their similarities, right? From their surrounding, from the locality in their memory. All right, let's go on here. 387 snippets of evidence for the associations with Abu Hamza. By scanning the entity categories, we naturally look for things expected and unexpected see, we can't do and quickly thing. see that the top city associated yeah, with Abu Hamza is can London, do a search in search. which is the geographic yeah. focus of our analysis. So we'll add London to the query and see how Abu Hamza and London are associated. Saffron returns all entities associated with Abu Hamza and London again in frequency ranked order with supporting evidence below. Now we see that the state of Oregon is included in these associations. This surprises us. How is Oregon associated with Abu Hamza and the transit bombings? By clicking on Oregon, the associations are immediately narrowed to Abu Hamza, London and Oregon. Evidence is returned to support these three entities. The supporting evidence reveals that Abu Hamza has 11 charges of terrorism, including the kidnapping and murder of hostages in Yemen, for attempting to set up a terrorist training camp in Bly, Oregon, and for sending recruits for terrorist training in Afghanistan. We now know that Abu Hamza is connected to many counts of terrorist activity, including recruiting people to become terrorists. This finding without knowing capability is a powerful productivity aid. With this information, we continue our investigation of Abu Hamza in the context of the London bomb. Returning to our query, we look for other interesting associations with terrorist activity. Interestingly, we see Richard Reed, the notorious shoe bomber. How is he associated with the London bombings in Abu Hamza? <coughs> Starting with the first piece of evidence, we learn that Abu Hamza preached to Richard Reed. Tan Weir is the next person we see in the person entity category list. We see that there are five pieces of evidence documenting his association with Abu Hamza. A quick look reveals that Abu Hamza preached three of the July 7 London suicide bombs. Diving deeper, we learn even more about Abu Hamza and his relationship to the London transit bombing. By clicking on the evidence link, we see the full document that includes the evidence along with an entity graph highlighting the relationships within the document. The entity graph can be used to navigate relationships and quickly find additional associations within the scope of the document. So far, we have learned that Abu Hamza played a key role as a preacher in instigating the London bombings. We learned the names of three of the suicide bombers, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, Tanwir, and Jermaine Lindsay. We connected Abu Hamza to the three suicide bombers, learning that he had direct contact with them at the Finsbury Park Mosque. What we don't yet know is whether Abu Hamza was the sole instigator of this attack and whether he worked in collaboration with others to plan the bombings. Let's continue on to see what we can learn. 
Another view of associations is presented in the network view. In this case, we see people associated with Abu Hamza in London. One person that is of particular interest is Osama bin Laden. By clicking on bin Laden, Saffron returns 76 pieces of evidence. In the evidence, we spot an article titled Hamza's Call to Murder the Queen, which depicts Hamza as a terror chief who helped dozens of terrorists enter Britain as part of his secret role as Osama bin Laden's prime fixer. Now we know that Hamza was bin Laden's terror chief and served him to direct the terrorist attacks in London. We know that the bombings were part of the larger terrorist efforts led by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Saffron Advantage has shown us that Abu Hamza was a Muslim preacher at the Finsbury Park Mosque who led a terrorist training camp in Oregon. He was facing charges of terrorist activities including kidnapping and murder in Yemen and that he recruited people to be sent to terrorist training camps in Afghanistan. He directly influenced Reid in the terrorist attack of attempting to blow up a plane and had direct ties to three of the suicide bombers in the July 7 attacks. He preached to them and others at the Finsbury Park Mosque a message of hatred of all non-believers. And the final piece of information was the discovery of his link to Osama bin Laden. So in just a few minutes, we discovered the key players in the London bombing, both the instigators and the suicide bombers themselves. And we linked them all to the known terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda. So here you have seen an example of sense making out of the box. Think about it. How would you have found those things as a human being in all this context? That's why I talk about automation of cognitive thinking. It's like I grew up and there were no pocket calculators left yet. So this is the replacement. This will help us to do cognitive thinking, to analyze huge amounts of text. And it goes pretty fast. It's very easy to use. And you can deep dive. And we also can do time. I mean, Google doesn't have time. Just to, I don't want to beat up always on Google. They have another task. They analyze the whole web. And also what they did was, uh, it's 15 years old. You know, How can they pivot? We will see. Can they do, can they do a distributed agents? I'm surprised. I don't see much there yet. But OK. So you had a couple of questions there. Well, that depends. Um, this was a two, a machine, two nodes. That isn't big, but we have, on average, it's about 10 nodes. It depends on, on the amount of uh, what you want to analyze. Yeah. Most of the compute power you need for the ingest, for, the anal for analyzing, for the ETL part. All right. There was another question. Yeah, yeah sure. Pocket saffron. Well, it would be nice, you know, that the, the next step will be that those things will be put into hardware. But we are not yet there. So, so at the moment, you still uh, you need a, you need a backend compute power. You will have to do something like Siri, right, connecting to the backend. Yeah, we we are discussing what is the sweet spot for the application. Let me know if you have an idea. We were thinking also personal security, that's where we come from. You know, what's good enough for Bill and Melinda Gates should be good enough for you too, if you have a security problem. But I don't know, it's a, it's a challenging thing. So far, we have been selling it as a platform, as a tool. And now we are going, and I have a slide on that, into personalized marketing. Second, you had a second question. Yeah. Oh, that's very easy. Palantir is beautiful in the, in the UI but they have no intelligence, right? Palantir, you have to get the data in, and if you talk, uh, usually the customers come to us after they did Palantir. Some didn't do Palantir. Gates did not do Palantir, for instance. But then they do Palantir, and then they say, oh, how do I get the data? Oh, wait a moment, I have to have a guy. He sits there, and he types it into a Excel spreadsheet, right? Palantir has no associative memory. They have no connections count. They cannot build a semantic graph. You do that as the user. That does not scale, right? But the UI is perfect. The perfect combination would be them and us. 
Uh, I have pushed that when I was at SAP, but you know, there is, this is a complex story offline. Shall you have a question and then you? Statement. Yeah, you can do that. There is NLP that is smart enough to handle that. And you do, it's, we, you come at some borders for the sentiment. We do sentiment analysis. If we have time in the Q&A, I can show you a, a Twitter demo where we analyze sentiment on Twitter. And there, people talk sarcastically. And then there's also a limit to that. But we, are, we do a pretty good sentiment out of the box. Yeah. Small company. We are 20 people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they subsidize HANA, right? The hosting cost, I wish I could offer that for that money, but this, they subsidize it, right? I assume. Um, it, it's a diff it, it, there's a difference to HANA. There are two differences. One is HANA works in memory. So the problem is, uh, if you don't fit all your data in memory, that's it. That's also the difference to Endeka. Endeka also is, is similar. Endeka, you have to help them to find the face sets. Face sets is um, it's just another word, a little bit another word for what we have seen here. Um, but if it doesn't fit in memory anymore, then you have to decide upfront, and then you have a reduction. A redu then you have to reduce your approach. You have a reductionist approach which is what we don't want to do. We want to find without knowing. We don't. We want to build a model once it's in the memory, but not before we put it in. And that is, that is unavoidable for any in-memory approach. And secondly, the memory costs 100 times more than the disk, and that will stay that way. So that, that's, that's why there's a big difference between in-memory approaches. ClickU has also an in-memory approach. If it doesn't fit in memory anymore, you have to decide what to do. And then you have a question, and you have an association, a connection with something that is not in memory. Now you are in trouble. You have to reload. It does, does not work that way. Yeah, that you cannot. That's the problem. No, no. The brain has no. The brain has no. The brain. The brain has access to the to the neurons. There is no difference between memory. And not right. This is the problem of the von Neumann approach. The, you have to get away from that. The, the difference between the CPU and and the memory is like uh, uh, from here to uh, Germany, if you think about it. You want to access your data. It's like traveling from here to Germany. Whereas in our case, there is no intrinsic timeline. It is. The localization works differently. The localization is semantic. It is not. It is not artificially from the hardware. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, no, this is a long discussion. Let's have it offline. There is, there is, there is something in neuroscience um, about um, the question is, can we forget or not? And there, there is a long, a strong evidence we cannot forget. We can only push it um, and say it is not important. And but it has nothing to do with time, like you. Are, Assume no. I don't know of any. I'm not a neuroscientist. I have a PhD in physics, but I don't know of any any work uh, that has anything to do with time. That has more to do. Uh, that has to do with other things. That is. That just seems to be like that. Okay. Next question. Is it a theoretical challenge or? It's the only computational challenge. It is a computational challenge, and you know, you know, IBM works on synapse, 
the last grand DAPA challenge on, on the compute power is on a machine that has the compute power of the human brain, and they have a red brain now. And by 2018, they will have the human brain. Then you run associative memories on top of that. It will be perfect. It will be much faster. But also, the, the, a, more, a, a closer step would be to make purpose, to make hardware that is purpose built for association, for matrices. And there are people working on that. OK. Next question. Very smart, yeah. I don't know, we will learn as we go, but you made a very important point. Um, but it depends on the data, right? But you made a very important point. The thing is, the more we have learned, the less we hit the case where we have to build a new memory or we have to add a new attribute. And that's especially true for news. There's only a certain vocabulary, and there's only a certain semantic content. If you look, for instance, at Wikipedia, that's not so much true. Wikipedia, almost every word occurs once. I'm always fascinated to, to just browse when I was a child. I love to browse through a book. Now we can browse through Wikipedia, and there are things you have never heard before, and it never ends, right? So things are very singular. But what, but what happens in everyday life and what happens in if we analyze blocks or if we analyze uh, log files, they are repetitive, and that's exactly what you say. It, uh, it will be better and better because you only change the count, and we access the count directly, so it becomes very, very, it, it does not, that's why it's worth linear, exactly. That's a deep reason. I don't know when it will break off. Uh, we'll see. Charles, you had a question. Thank you. I greet them. Hello. <laughs> good. That's a good question. So I have still a couple of slides. I have to jump now. The next one is uh, we work uh, with Chayat F. The sudden command, keep this question, I come to that. I can also jump right away to it. But I mean, let me just uh, finish it in that way. So that we do this, they, they do draft trafficking and they look for the guys uh, who look for drugs and there we use uh, the time component. So we look at the correlation over time when two, um, uh, when events co-occur, for instance, um, a location, that's where the drop was the last time, a boat, and a mechanic, for instance, because this is very expensive. There's always a mechanic in standby. And you look at the, at the correlation, and when they co-occur, then you know that this might happen. Um, this is an example. We do the MRO for Boeing, and this is the value. You mean Boeing, you know, master of the universe when it comes to engineering and all of this. That was the accuracy before 63% and 18% false positive. We brought it up to 100% accuracy and 2% false positive. And it takes what the pilot says, it takes sensors, it, it does the knowledge learning, what the mechanic says, and so and so on. It takes all the structure, and they have a lot of structured data too. And then you predict when do you have to replace a spare part. That's a very nice task, a very interesting task in prediction. If you, do, if you predict, uh, if you do it wrongly, the chopper or the plane is on the ground. It costs you millions of dollars. If you replace it too early, this is what the Air Force does, for instance. The Air Force replaces the flight recorder every time uh, they do a maintenance. And then uh, that costs you a lot of money. Commercial airliners don't do it. What happens, commercial airliners, one of the most reasons uh, for delay is, or what happens the most of the time, that the part that is on fault is the battery. So what you want to do is you want to precisely predict this moment, this phase. So there will be a huge change in the supply chain. You know, and then I come from the supply chain. That's why SAP hired me. Uh, I'm a specialist in optimization and linear and nonlinear and whatever you like. 
Um, and that is what we kind of envision, but we didn't come up to it to really do uh, predictive maintenance. But we, uh, that's where we are going. And then this is Curtis Wright, uh, where we do. Um, uh, this is the guys who control the nuclear power plants, and uh, where we look at error reports. But what I want to come to to answer your question: What do we do? Engine machine learning is we do. Uh, we predict the threats at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, so, so we have a way, and I show you how we do that, to predict the threat, and then you see a threat score for persons of interest. And this threat score changes. And then you see the change, and then you look at it, and then you can do the deep dive. And why can you do that? Because we have those triples materialized. And so what is very unique about uh, what we do here, and I jump a little bit to this slide here, this is the one. So the prediction has three elements. It has the ETL part in chest where you have the hybrid data, where you unify it, where you define groups and the individual risk vector, and where you build the multidimensional associative array. And I gave you a simple example of that. And the dimension of this risk vector is one million. It has about a million attributes in it. Now you build a million by a million by a million, that is a trillion matrix. It's actually a tensor, right? It's also the difference to Google. Google has only a matrix, right? You don't see, you don't have another dimension to that. And now the thing is, um, you want to do prediction. There are two tricky things. Prediction in real life, or what is left of it, in the sense that all the other predictions have been done already, they are nonlinear. So you attribute separate in a nonlinear space. And this is why, if you know that the uh, uh, neural networks, they have a hidden layer to do the nonlinearity, and um, other approaches like support vector machines, if you have heard of that, it's the kernel trick, that's what you have to do. The tricky, the interesting questions, any complex problem nowadays, the space separates nonlinearly. So in the in the support vector machines, you have to find the kernel. It's a human being who does it. In our case, it is a white box approach. I want to stress that it is a white box approach. We find the triples, the important triples, automatically. How do we do this? <coughs> we do it basically uh, by using the entropy by using the mutual information and the three-way mutual information which is called interaction information. And that is very nice because the entropy is a partial correlation if it is structured data, and it also works for unstructured data. So it offers itself perfectly. Then it's not called a partial correlation. And uh, your task, the task that you have is you look at this huge amount of data, of big data, and you build your you build your attributes and you want to know and they are random variables how they are related and then you can do pairwise correlation like our competitors Planck does but uh, you can have attributes that are pairwise correlated not correlated but then they are correlated as a triple right and an example that you all know as computer scientists the XOR but it's a real world example if you think about the mushroom data it's where people do benchmarks for classification you have that and I can give you a real-world example of that is, for instance, think of we, we analyze, we know the uh, employment status. So one attribute is, are people employed or not? The other, and, and what employment they have. The other one is, how do they buy? And then we want to predict, it, are they criminal or not? So being employed or not has nothing to do with being criminal or not, right? Ah, there's no correlation. Uh, buying cash or with credit card or with check has also nothing to do between criminal or not. Being employed and unemployed, there are different ways to buy. Only if we have all three of them, there is a person that buys a new car, cash, and is unemployed, we suddenly have a very high probability for criminal. And this is, this is non-linear. This is why, uh, why actually there was a breakdown for passive Trump and some guy, famous guy, wrote this paper, people misunderstood it. He showed perceptrons can only solve linear problems. And then it was a long time, nothing. And then there came neural networks with the hidden layer stuff. And there are a lot of problems with hidden layers. So what we do is we have a white box approach to find the important pairs and triples, right? And then we take them, and then we calculate the weights, 
and that's how we do the prediction. And the prediction can be done in a linear way. I'm not sure if you got all of that. That's, that's a separate lecture in itself. That's the third leg. This is the statistics. But so much to the question, how do we do this? Um, uh, our measure is entropy. And there is also another measure out there that came from Harvard and some guys from Oxford. It's called maximal information coefficient, which is very similar to that. The thing is, there is a way to do pairwise or triple correlations for a huge amount of data to find a pattern, to find the relevant pattern, and then to use it uh, for separation of your space for prediction, which is basically a classification. So that's the answer. And then I want to one last slide, which is the architecture, right? If you know what this is. So here we are. I may have been plastering you, I guess. Now this is. There's a little bit the architecture where you go in. We can do streams. Um, you have the memory base. Every big data problem has three elements. I want to make this point. It's very important to understand. Three elements. It has the ETL part. It has the analytics and storage part. It has a UI part. There's no company out there who can, all, who can do all three very well. That's why you see Tableau. They have very nice UI. You see, um, you see Palantir. You see ClickView. ClickView goes a little bit down here, but uh, I talk to the customers. They're not. They don't find without knowing, and 